Welcome to another one of our Sabbath School lesson studies. This quarter we're studying the Gospel of Mark. It's special to take a book of the Bible and to study it chapter by chapter. It, it really inspires you, it encourages you, and you see the completeness of Scripture in that Bible book. The Gospel of Mark can be divided into two separate sections. Mark has 16 chapters. The first eight chapters talk about the Christ as the Messiah. And Mark attempts to prove that Christ is the Messiah, not simply by saying he is the Messiah, but he uses prophecy to show that John the Baptist was predicted in the Old Testament and he was to prepare the way for the Messiah and that Jesus is the messianic fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies talking about John announcing the Messiah. Then, Mark points out in his gospel in the first eight chapters that Jesus is Messiah based on the miracles that he worked. And so you have a number of miracles, particularly in chapters two and three. You have like a sequence of five miracles in chapter three alone. And then Jesus' teachings demonstrate he's the Messiah. So prophecy, actions, teachings in the first eight chapters. The last eight chapters make a transition and they transition to this journey that Christ was on, a journey to the cross. And they show that Christ is the Messiah, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy that would come as the suffering servant, the one that would die for humanity, the one that would redeem us by his grace, the one that would reach out to us and woo us or charm us by his love, the one that would hang on the cross for us. and. Uh, and deliver us from guilt and condemnation of sin and release us from the bondage and power of sin. So two sections. First section, Christ is the Messiah, prophecy, actions, teachings. Second section, Christ is Messiah because of his redemptive act on the cross. And the last eight chapters are the journey to the cross. Now we're studying this book called the book of Mark. Who was this? Mark. We'll jump right into it in the quarterly. We'll go right to Sunday's lessons. Who was this Mark? Well, we find a little bit about him in Acts chapter 12, not a great deal, but we learn a little bit about him in Acts chapter 12. You'll recall that the background of the 12th chapter of the book of Mark is that Peter is in prison an angel releases him from prison and Peter is taken through the streets that early morning and he comes to the house of Mary. We have the first mention of Mark here in Acts 12, verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So what, what do we learn about Mark there. We learn that he had a mother and the disciples were praying in her home. She must have been a very prominent woman in the Christian community there. We learn also that John Mark was her son. So he had been acquainted from the earliest age with the apostles. He had been acquainted from his youngest time with the believers in Christ and uh, Peter later called John Mark his son, not biological son, but a son in the faith. So he, he was a young man that was an aspiring missionary. The next time we see him is in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, the disciples lay hands on Paul and Barnabas, and send them on their first missionary journey. They fast, they pray. When you come to Acts 13, verse 13, it says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from 
Paphos, they came to Pergia in Pampilia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John departs. He goes back from Jerusalem. John Mark does. He's been on this missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. But what was his function? What was he supposed to be doing there? Well, the fifth verse tells us of Acts 13, when they arrived in Salmas, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So here's the picture. Paul and Barnabas have hands laid upon them. They're ordained to go forth to preach the gospel throughout the Mediterranean world. They're on their missionary journey. They take as their assistant, as their helper, a young man by the name of John Mark. John Mark goes with them, but then because of the hardship or the difficulty of the way, he goes back home. There's an interesting comment by Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles, page 169. You'll read that on Sunday's lesson, the last paragraph. It says, Mark overwhelmed with fear and discouragement. I'm quoting from Acts of the Apostles, page 169 wavered for a time in his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. Unused to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and privations of life uh, and on the way. So here, John Mark, this young man who's on this missionary journey, becomes fearful. He, he looks at the challenges. Now, challenges that Paul faced were quite Great. I mean, you'll remember Paul was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He he spent uh, time in the sea when he was cast into the sea. I mean, he was imprisoned. And when the hardships of the way got too much for John Mark, he left. He he said, I'm out of here. I need to go back home. The interesting thing about this is that um, the scripture says, that, there, uh, that when a second missionary journey was going to take place in Acts 15, that Paul and Barnabas have a dispute. What's the dispute over? Acts 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brethren in every city where we've preached the word of God and see how they're doing. What an important spiritual principle. Here people were converted. Here people had come to Christ. Here people had been saved in God's kingdom. And Paul and Barnabas say, we're not going to leave them alone. We're going to nurture them. We're going to support them. Oh, would to God when people are baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church that we would nurture them, that we'd support them, that we'd encourage them. Paul and Barnabas didn't leave them on their own. Verse 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Now it's interesting. John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. Barnabas was his uncle. And so Barnabas saw potential in this young man. Barnabas saw possibilities in this young man. Now Paul was a passionate, driven evangelist. And he didn't want any nonsense. He didn't want to take somebody along that he thought might leave them again. He had gone through that once. So it says, but Paul insisted, verse 38, that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pampilia and had not gone with them to the work. Verse 39, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another and Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed and and he was commanded by the brethren by the grace of God. Now look, Paul and Barnabas had a conflict. They were both men of God, different personalities, But this conflict became so sharp that Barnabas went his way and Paul went his way. There are times that godly workers do have conflict. There are times that people see things differently. It doesn't mean one is right and necessarily one is wrong. It means that we have different dispositions, different backgrounds, different ways of looking at things. Paul and Silas went one direction Barnabas and John Mark went another direction. And here's the fascinating thing. God used the contention to form two missionary teams rather than one. You know, there are times that people work together. They're godly people, but they just 
feel the time is come for them to branch out in different directions. And that's all part of God's work. There are times in congregations where church planting takes place, where a group leaves one church, and I should say they should never do that because of anger, bitterness, or resentment, but they may feel, hey, we have another calling by God. And so that's what happened here. God actually used this contention to develop two missionary teams. But that's not the end of the story. When you go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, now we're talking about 20 years later, approximately, approximately 20 years later. What's going on now? There's a quite a different scene that's taking place. We're going to look at the book of Colossians, chapter 4, and we're going to look there at verse 10. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Colossia. Paul has been in prison, and he writes in Colossians 4, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So now, where's Mark? He's with Paul. He's rejoined his team, and Paul trusts him as a valued colleague. We find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, another mention of Mark. Here is a man that was given a second chance. Here's a man that in that second chance improved that opportunity. Here's somebody that 20 years later is now a trusted colleague of Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 says, Only Luke is with me. So Paul's writing to Timothy. Paul's an old man, deeply etched lines upon his face, gray hair, dying now. And he says, only Luke is with me. That's his doctor. Get Mark and bring him with you. Why? He's useful to me for ministry. Here, the one that Paul didn't want to take with him, the one that Paul didn't trust, he says, now he's useful to me for ministry. Get him and bring him. You know, there are times that young people make mistakes. Sometimes they're big mistakes but yet they have potential for God. Two things, Barnabas saw potential in John Mark and did not in any way cast him off. But secondly, Paul was big enough to see the change in John Mark's life and then welcomed him back as a trusted colleague. We find John Mark mentioned also in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. And here, John Mark is mentioned again. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, and it's in verse 13. It says, She is in Babylon. That's, he's referring to this noble lady. Elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. So Peter says Mark is a son in the gospel. He, he's a valuable man of Christ. John Mark came to Jesus and he had one of those conversion moments where Christ totally changed his life. He was no longer afraid of the trials on the way, no longer afraid of the difficulties they might experience, no more intimidated by the challenges, but now he's a faithful worker for God. Be charitable. Be charitable. There are people that are going to make mistakes, but yet, in the context of those mistakes, they could be growing in Christ. There was this amazing transformation in the life of John Mark. Now we go to Tuesday's lesson. We know now who wrote the book. Mark wrote it. A young man who at first had fear, left the missionary journeys, but a young man who was rehabilitated by the grace of Christ, transformed by the grace of Christ, has this amazing conversion. He's the one that wrote it. How does he start his book in the Gospel of Mark? Well, let's go back. He actually starts with prophecy. He actually starts with the Old Testament prophecies. Mark chapter 1. And we're looking here at three prophecies. We read Mark 1 verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So this is the gospel. In Greek, it's the euangelion. He is the one who, Jesus is the one who forgives our sins. Jesus is the one who redeems us by his grace. Jesus is the one who transforms us by his love. Jesus is the one whose justice leads him to have mercy. 
That is the gospel, as it is written in the prophets. Now, notice Mark is quoting the Old Testament prophecy. Jesus is demonstrated as Messiah by his fulfillment of the prophetic teachings of the Old Testament, by his own teachings, and by his works. So he quotes, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who prepare the way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So he's quoting Malachi 3, verse 1, Isaiah 40, verse 3. So who was that messenger that would come? The messenger was John the Baptist. And what we prepare for, he would prepare the way of the Lord. He would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And so we find a description of John the Baptist here. And in that description, we find, what is Mark doing? He's setting the stage for the coming of the Messiah. So Tuesday's lesson is all about how prophecy set the stage for the coming of the Messiah. Prophecy today is setting the stage for the coming of the Messiah. The prophecies of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11, setting the stage for the coming of the Messiah. The prophecies in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, through 12, you know, those three angels' messages, and you think about that first angel's message where John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. You see, here's a message to fear God, to give glory to God, to recognize in the judgment hour to worship the Creator. Look, just as John the Baptist had a message to prepare for the first coming of Jesus, a message calling men and women based on prophecy to repentance, to confession, to obedience. So God has an end time message in the book of Revelation. It's rooted in the gospel, the gospel of God's mercy, grace, the gospel of God's goodness. But it also calls us to fear God, that means to obey God, that fear means to take God seriously, to put him first in your thinking. Fear God, give glory to him in our lifestyle, the way we live. Fearing God has to do with how we think. Giving glory to God has to do with how we live. Why? Because we're in the judgment hour. And it's a call to worship the creator, not worship the beast. So just as Mark talks about John the Baptist preparing the way for the first coming of Jesus, so Revelation, this same uh, prophet, these, these prophecies in Revelation talk about preparing the world for the second coming of Jesus. We jump over now to Wednesday's lesson, the baptism of Christ. In the baptism of Christ, um, notice who's present at the baptism of Christ, which I think is quite significant. You look there at Mark chapter 1, verse 9 and onward. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, he was baptized of John in the Jordan. Notice baptism is not by sprinkling. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. It says that as he's baptized, the Spirit descends upon him, and a voice comes from heaven, verse 11, saying, My beloved, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. When men and women step out by faith and accept Christ, when they walk into the water of baptism, just like Jesus did. Why are we baptized by immersion? Because Jesus was. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God came down upon him. Why does it say the Spirit of God came down upon him now? Well, didn't the Spirit conceive him in the womb of Mary? Didn't the Spirit of God guide him all of his life? Certainly. But what is unique about this moment? Jesus is getting ready to begin his messianic ministry and the Spirit of God comes to strengthen, to support him. And he can always look back to that moment of baptism where the Spirit of God came upon him to promise him the assurance that he could have victory over Satan. If you follow Jesus in Bible baptism, God has promised you the Holy Spirit. God has promised that your weakness can be united with his strength, that your frailty can be united with his enduring might, that your feebleness can be united with his power. God himself empowers us. Jesus faced Satan, not in his own power, but in the power of the Spirit. And you and I can do that too. Notice there's a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Every time 
we come to Jesus. Every time we desire to please him, it pleases him. Every time we desire to do his will, it brings joy to him. Every time we desire to obey him, it makes him happy. You can please God today by determining to do his will. Why did the father say to the son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased because Jesus made that decision that day to leave the carpenter shop of Nazareth and go on his journey, his messianic journey. If you've never been baptized before, as you're baptized, not waiting for the power to overcome, but as you sense God's power already working in your life, God will give you more power as you walk into the pool of baptism. And second, if you've never been baptized, the incredible good news is that you'll be pleasing Jesus. And if you've been baptized, we please Jesus every single day as we walk with him. This week's lesson concludes with something quite fascinating, and it's what are the three parts of the gospel message? And there is a chart on the, in Thursday's lesson, and you'll find that chart um, here under July 4. And the chart you look at, it says category and, con- and content. First, you have a time prophecy. That time prophecy is found in the book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel predicted the time that the Messiah would come. He predicted that in a prophecy of 490 years. And uh, the prophecy would go forth from the begin at the going forth of the command to restore Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was in ruins. And Daniel had made a prediction that when you see the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that took place in 457 BC, it would be 69 weeks, prophetic weeks, one prophetic day equals one literal year, Numbers 14, 34, Ezekiel 4, 6, um, 69 prophetic weeks, 483 literal days, would take us down to the coming of the Messiah. So 457 BC, 483 years forward would take you to 27 AD. The decree went forth in the fall. Jesus was exactly baptized in the fall of 27. Now here's something amazing. Christ is baptized, and in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled. What time? Jesus, the Messiah, was baptized exactly on time. The time is fulfilled. He was baptized in the fall of 27. Well, that time prophecy in Daniel, if you're not familiar with it, it's really a marvelous prophecy. Go back and study Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9. In Daniel 9, you'll find this prophecy. Jesus was crucified on time, 31 AD. The gospel went to the Gentiles on time, 34 AD. But let's go back to our chart. A time prophecy. Daniel's time prophecy, Christ is baptized on time, the time is fulfilled. There was a promise. What was the promise in Mark chapter 1, verse 15? The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So here is the promise. God promised throughout all the Old Testament to send the Messiah. And the covenant promise is the Messiah would come. And here is the call to discipleship. What is it? Repent and believe the gospel. So you have a prophecy a promise, and the call to discipleship. Exactly parallel with the last days. We are living in the last days of verse history. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. We have a promise. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again. That's the covenant promise. And then you have the call, the call to repentance, the call to confession, the call to be ready for the coming of Jesus, where Jesus himself says to us, to you, and to me, fear God, let's obey him. Give glory to God. The hour of his judgment has come. Give your life to worshiping the creator. And of course, one of the great signs of worshiping the creator is the Bible Sabbath. So we have a parallel between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And we have that appeal to be ready for the coming of Jesus. And as we journey through Mark this quarter, and we learn about Jesus, 
We learn about his love, his grace, his mercy, his power. We will feel, we will sense an end time call to commit our lives to this Jesus. We'll sense how much this Jesus loves us and we'll sense how much he wants us in heaven. Our hearts will be stirred. Our emotions will be stimulated. Our minds will be filled with that sense of Christ and the desire to live for him in these last days. We'll sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit to go deeper into our study of the word, deeper in our prayer life, deeper in his love and grace. This quarter, God's going to speak to us as we journey through the Gospel of Mark. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you with all of our hearts for Jesus. We thank you for the Gospel of Mark. We thank you that we can walk through this book chapter by chapter to sense your love, your grace, and your power. In Jesus' name, amen.